much stuff to get to, and I mean so much stuff to get to on the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. With me, senior editor Nate Bauer. We talk to a lot of people from Penn State football today, media availability for the bowl game. So, Nate, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for making time today. And what of that do you remember at this point? <laughs> Hey, just just keep that music going, buddy. I like it. <laughs> it's good. You can avoid the fact that, yeah, my, my brain, like yours, I assume is mush after uh, three three hours, really, yeah. of of availabilities uh, for Penn State today. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Let's start at the end. Let's start with Manny Diaz. He was the last person we talked to. And for the record, we're recording before uh, Penn State practice, which is this afternoon. So we're not going to see anything from Manny Diaz in practice in particular. But like, you know, that interaction on the football field, all those observations, those will be for another time. So yeah. in the press conference, what was your impression of Manny Diaz in his first as defensive coordinator? Yeah, I, I just I thought he sounded like a head coach. He just everything that he talked about was very well thought out and quick quick on his toe I, I don't really know how to describe I thought, it I mean I thought the same thing I thought this he was very impressive you can my thought was you can see why he was a head coach absolutely and and uh, look like uh, I, I will say that uh, of things that I expected him to have to answer today uh one about what happened with the temple job yeah was absolutely not among them. And then even, even um, you know, and it's it's to the reporters' questions that, you know, they, they brought them uh, up. It's to their credit that they brought them up. But, yeah. you know, kind of uh, after his statement about leaving Miami that he made, you know, pretty publicly expressing his disappointment, I didn't know that he was going to be asked to address that situation again. And yeah. he was. And I thought he handled it. I thought he handled it really well, honestly. I, I just certainly you can understand everything that that goes into this, right? Like this this whole big thing of college football and and changing jobs and the coaching carousel. Like he he was just very very on point with all of it, and not in a rehearsed kind of way. Yeah. A hey, these are these are thoughtful, rational, honest. Opinions. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Honest, honest opinions. And so that was, that was, um, it was just, it was all very interesting. It was, uh, also what I was taking, what I, what I felt the last two weeks is a fraction of what, uh, what Penn state coaches have felt trying to keep up with everything of national signing day, defensive coordinator search names coming up as far as guys that could be the new defensive coordinator, or that might be leaving. And James Franklin touched on that of like, uh, when he when he mentioned a deep dive into the offense for Mike Yersich and what went wrong is like I have had so many other things on my plate that we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, and Manny Diaz kind of echoed the same things of I was fired and then I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought I was going to have time and now I'm here sitting with you guys because everything has to happen quickly in these last two weeks. Yeah, and and I'm glad that you brought it up that it it brings a second and and not that you know um he has to be a yes man or anything to that effect but for him to 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 provide a perspective i think from for the media to hear and for fans to hear of hey this is what the dynamic actually is right like this is what a, a head coach deals with which is all of these different things. I, I mean, I, he said it, I don't want to uh, misquote him, but something to the effect of there are only so many decisions that one man can make yep. in one day. And yep. so the role of a defensive coordinator and the role of an offensive coordinator, and James Franklin, again, has said this in the past, but I think sometimes we we misunderstand or start to think other things. <laughs> There's so many things on a head coach's plate yeah. that the – the role of those coordinators is you have to be the head coach of your side of the field. Yeah. Like that is your take deal. Care of, is, take care of those things and only bring me the things that you can't take care of. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so to, to, to have that second set of eyes who has had that experience, um, you know, I, I just, I just see 
a situation at Penn State where that becomes that it's a value add. It's something mm-hmm. that can be added to the picture and something that he understands, Manny Diaz understands and can bring back to the job as a defensive coordinator and, you know, handle things effectively as a result. Yeah. Uh, some of the conversation about uh, sameness was interesting of going back to Bob Shoup and where they kind of converge in their philosophies about football. That was all very interesting. By the way, uh, the full press conference is up on our YouTube channel, so if you're watching this video after we're done talking about it, you can go see all the things we're referencing. Mike Yersich and Manny Diaz and James Franklin all up at uh, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast version, go check it out there. And if you want instant analysis, reaction, and comments about all those things, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just $1. I, for, I I took a Thanksgiving break from really talking to you about it after Black Friday. But we're back. It's the holiday season, the last push until Christmas. If you haven't gotten somebody a stocking stuffer, give them the digital love of $1. Shows how much you love them. Because you're getting them a, a, a subscription to Blue White Illustrated that will last the year round. It's better than the Jelly of the Month Club, Nate. It is. And honestly, I'm not a salesman at all. I I can't do it nearly as well as you just did. But I think the fact that you get next year's signing day. Right. right? This is 12 months out. I mean, it's incredible. How can you pass it up? A dollar. It's amazing. You get get, uh, spring ball. You get the summer when you're bored or you're on vacation and you're scrolling through what Nate's doing and then you get camp and then you get the first week of the season. You get all of it. Next year's signing day, next year's bowl prep, all of it for just a dollar. Just look into the future. It's called an investment. It's not crypto because this is absolutely going to return. You're not going to wake up one day and half of it's gone. I promise. You are going to blow up the comments section on something completely unrelated to Penn if, State football. I love it. Listen, if, if you if you want me to get going about something, let's talk off camera about crypto. So ugh. NFTs, let's go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, speaking of manipulating things for your, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about some of the other guys that we heard today. Uh, especially from some of the coordinators we heard from. We were both talking to Mike Yersich today about the offense, the performance this year, and some of the interesting things he had to say about uh, what transpired in 2021, his first year. What did you take away from that conversation with Mike Yersich? Yeah, it, I, look, there are certain things that everyone is looking for, right? And so when Mike Yersich arrived at Penn State and had these high expectations attached to his name and his resume, And then to have produced the season that Penn State produced this season, I think people are looking for ownership. And he took that today. I I don't think there was any question about that. Is He said, look, Penn State was not good enough. The the offense wasn't good enough. His performance personally, Mike Yersich personally, was not good enough. None of it was good enough. And so, um, you know, there's there's always uh, an element of – wanting to point out one thing as being what inhibited success to the level that right right that Penn State wanted it to be because you can wrap your never... hands around it you can you can Correct. you can understand the one thing instead of having to understand the big picture to understand the one thing if the offensive line was just much better everything would have been fixed mm-hmm. right like that i mean i and there's an argument to be made that that might have been the case or something to yeah. that extent but if you're Mike Yersich and you're going back and you're watching the film and you're you're you know kind of analyzing what the offense was this season, there's a reality behind it that it was much more than that. That there was there were a lot of different moving parts and things that weren't up to the standard that they need to be for Penn State to score bottom line the points that needed to be scored to to have a successful offense. And so, yeah. you know, I I thought that a lot of his answers reflected that of just a general sense of Hey, uh, and he did bring it up actually short yardage. Yep. Right here. Here's a specific area that involves every piece of that offense. All 11 guys is the short yardage, whether it was the play calls, whether it was the execution, these are the things that we got to figure out personnel. We got to figure these things out and be better at it moving forward. 
I want to come back to the running game of the offensive line because I had a, a nice long conversation with Caden Wallace to start the day. Some really interesting stuff I thought came out of that. But when it came to the running game and this season in particular, one, I think, cathartic thing to hear for Penn State football fans. And again, you can go hear it for yourself at the end of Mike Yersich's interview on our YouTube channel. He brought up the Illinois game. What did he have to say about that particular game and what was the context there? Yeah, so it was. It's funny because it may have been his best question, and yeah. unfortunately, just by nature of Zoom, during his answer, there was a sixty-second heads up that that the meeting the, room the was room, closing. The meeting room was <laughs> closing, and so he starts in on yeah, like and and again, I don't want to misquote him, but to the effect of. This was the most frustrating game that he's ever coached in his career. Yeah. That, Something about being one of the worst losses, if not the worst loss that he's had. Yeah. And and so Illinois was dropping eight in the cut. The question was pointed of how do you, why would you keep committing to the run when yeah. you're having, in some of these games, the only thing that you're doing effectively is passing the ball. Why did you keep running the ball? Yeah. And his answer was, look, like sometimes there are situations that dictate because even if you are having some limited success passing the ball, if the defense that you're throwing against is dropping eight in the coverage, you have to be able to run the ball in yeah. those circumstances. You, yeah. you just have to. And so they tried. Yeah. They just they just weren't able to execute it. And then as he was continuing down that train of thought, boop. That was, yeah, that was the end. It was literally was like, blah, 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 and then we were on a, a on the uh, empty screen. Uh, so in, in, that's something that that teams did to them all year long. And and I know that we can go back and forth about the Michigan State game. And I've said my piece about that and how they should have been throwing for reasons in certain situations. This is because of the the elements, and they went the other way because of the elements. One thing you cannot deny is if you have two safeties 20 yards off the line of scrimmage, the other team is gifting you at least five yards, and you have to be able to go get those. If you can't, that's a systematic failure of your offensive line, your offense, and all of those things. So it is very much a theme of the season was everyone was daring them to run, and they had to throw the ball, and consequently, they dinked and dunked their way down the field, and Sean Clifford was good in that environment. One really good question that was not asked of Mike Yersich was, where does Sean Clifford need to improve for this offense to take the next step next year? That would be an interesting thing to hear the answer to, but I guess we just won't. So, uh, Nate, what, what's your thought on that idea of where, where Sean Clifford in that environment and in that context needs to improve so he can, as James Franklin talked about, have aspirations of the next level and Penn State can succeed at a higher level in 2022 because Penn State fans are not, there's a good section that are not happy feeling like they're trapped into another year with Sean Clifford. How do they how do they escape that? I, I, think, I think that the question that is better asked is, has Sean Clifford hit his ceiling? Right. Has he, right? Like, it, has he reached his maximization? And I don't think that this year was a demonstration that he has, right? Like, mm -hmm. last year was such a disaster for him. Obviously, he improved on 2019. Um, this season, it went before he got hurt. And so there is still an opportunity for him to continue to develop. Um, and to, to your point, and a, another question that I, I didn't think was asked, but probably would provide an interesting answer is, for a guy like Mike Yersich, most of the time you're dealing with an 18 or a 19-year-old brain. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. uh, a 23-year-old brain, a 24-year-old brain, and, and somebody who works as hard and is as invested into the game as Sean Clifford is, they're dramatically different things. And so yep. what is what does the opportunity represent to Mike Yersich to work with someone who you're really speaking the same language uh, through through that process and that building process? For somebody to, to get it and that's it, I, I think that is something of a rarity in college football. And so you, uh, my expectation would be that obviously, and you've been through this endlessly, yeah, he Sean Clifford needs to improve the deep ball, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah, uh, un, not debatable. Um, but in terms of 
reading coverages and making throws into spaces, right? Where you're anticipating where your receiver is going to be like those things. I, I, I think that you demonstrated through this season that he, he did make advancements in those areas. Yes, he did from last season. So there you, there you go. Not only did you augment what was definitely not my question, but then you added another one on top. So, uh, <laughs> that's what I do. I'm all questions, no answers. Um, what the the other thing that was brought up clearly we were going to talk about the young quarterbacks coming into the room uh what did he say about those guys Drew Aller Bo Perbula and they're always going to be compared because they're in the same class but what did he say about those guys and their learning process early on in uh in in college football and you're you're genuinely going to have to fill me in because I was very distracted by a bunch of things when he was talking about this stuff yeah, I, it was it was his first answer, so I was a little in and out myself. But the 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 thing that stands out to me in his answer, but also I think is reflected in some of what Noah Kane was talking about with Nick Singleton is how no nonsense these guys are at that age. Yeah, right. Like uh, they they want to get better. They want to. They want to be invested. They love the game. They are all business. And so, when that's the like, when that's the baseline, when that's what you're starting with, I think that puts you in a really good position at an early age to succeed, while still understanding how difficult it is. How difficult it is uh, from the beginning of your career yeah. to make that type of an impact. And so, Sean Clifford, meanwhile, which Mike Yurcich talked about, provides naturally kind of that buffer I, yeah. I don't think it i don't think it changes the fact that if one of those guys is prepared and is so good that he's going to beat out a 60 year senior fine you know so be it like that that's good on you for for being that well prepared and being that um being in that situation where you can compete and win a job but more likely is the reality that Sean Clifford is going to be in a better position to succeed and will set a standard for those guys yeah. moving forward because you, what, they already get it, right? Like they already understand what is needed right. at this level and have the willingness to approach it that way. But there's a very real difference between being primed for that and actually executing it. So they're going to yeah. have to come in and do that. And one of the things he talked about, uh, Mike Yersich did that that I thought was interesting is there are only so many hours he can coach those guys. So having yep. a peer that is at that level is really important. And Sean Clifford being going into his sixth year provides that. And Sean seems like the sort of guy that is going to take those guys and actually teach them and isn't going to see them as threats. He's going to be a good steward of the university. So that's yep. going to be an interesting dynamic throughout the season, having those two young players. And, and somebody asked me that the likelihood that either of them start at some point in 2021. And I was just like, eh, we're so we're, the cart is so far ahead of the horse that the poor horse is probably choking on the reins at this point, just being dragged behind it. So what happened to Christian Veyu? Well, that's another question, right? Right. It's just the next thing. So let's talk about some of the players that we, we interacted with today. You spoke with Noah Kane. What came out of that that you found interesting? There's there's two things I want to touch on first. The first one is his health, because I think that's the important place to start. What did he yep. say about his health in 2021 and what it is going forward into this bowl game? That he wasn't, <laughs> right? Like Shocker. Have, I know. Can you believe it? No. I, <laughs> I felt bad for him, uh, right? Like during, during the interview, him having to acknowledge – um, you know, and you're talking about a kid who, who through the first, what, 10 games of his career as a true freshman had all of these telltale signs of, uh, I mean, really dominant having it. Dominance. Yeah. Like yep. just, just, and so I actually, I even asked him if Sean Clifford's return maybe sets the table for him to take advantage of an extra year. You know, like that, mm -hmm. does that, does that provide a window for you as something that might be an opportunity? And like, <laughs> I felt bad, I felt bad asking the question because right. this is, this is a guy who three years and out 
seemed yeah. like a very realistic possibility. He was, the, he was the first one that said that. He said, I'm there for the next three years. And James Franklin after that was like, let's slow down a bit, guys. You know? Yeah. So it, it's... So, yeah. But, 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 uh, to answer your question, he said that this is the healthiest that he's been and that this bowl game represents an opportunity for them to demonstrate how good they are, you know, uh, kind of rectify some of those misses. And on top of that, there's the caveat of, yeah, the run, it, they just, they didn't do, they weren't as good enough or they weren't as good as they wanted to be this season yeah. in the running backs room and as the, it, for the offense as a whole. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's, that was kind of one of the things that, that did stand out to me was him explaining, look, uh, the running backs were disappointed with their own performances, but the offense works as a unit. Mm -hmm. The offense works as 11 guys. And if 11 guys aren't doing or executing the way that they need to, or understanding what their responsibilities are the way that they need to, then you're going to have some system failures. And yeah. that was effectively what he said was happening. And you, you mentioned the word trust and communication. Do you think that there was a trust issue on the offense this year that led to some of these problems? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, look, like he, he, he danced around it a little bit, but I mm -hmm. think that there was a, an undertone of what he was saying of, look, the offensive line was going through its own set of challenges that really just never got rectified. Yeah. And so because of that, if, if you're running back and you run into a brick wall 10 times, do you think that the wall is going to be there on the 11th time? Right. <laughs> or right? right. And so you, you start to do things, yourself and I mean we talk about this all the time and this this counts on the defensive side of, of the ball as well is you start ad-libbing based on what your expectations are of the guy in front of you or the guy yeah. next to you and if and yeah. if you can't count on the guy in front of you doing what needs to be done or having an impact in the way uh, or an effectiveness that you're expecting then you start to think okay well how will I adjust what might work in this right. situation because i gotta get the job done you know as the guy with the ball Correct. in his hands i gotta get the job done and that was something Correct. i asked caden wallace about when when i was speaking to him of you know and, and this was probably phrased poorly but i asked you know if there if you're going into a situation and you know because he, he started out we were talking about uh going up against a three down front an odd front in the bowl game and how they struggled against that this year and he was excited to implement everything he had learned this year in this bowl game in a new environment. So I thought that was interesting, and I, I kind of pressed him on, so what are the differences? What is it that you need to do? Uh, what are the challenges? How do you overcome it? And he talked about how individual techniques, individual footwork for you specifically. So Phil Troutwine, to people that were, have been wondering all year, what is he doing? I asked this, so there's individual, he, he will work with each player individually tailoring, okay, your footwork in this situation needs to be like this, you need to do this with your hands, so they were working on it, they had a plan of attack, it just never came together, and I think that's the frustration that you and I heard from Mike Yersich is, they were throwing, it seems like, they were throwing everything at the wall when it came yep. to the offensive line and the run game, and nothing was sticking. Um, yep. And I, to me, it comes down to, and the, the thing I asked about with Caden Wallace of, okay, so you're going into a situation where you have to execute a block and you know that you're not, you haven't really been doing that. Because everyone can see, everyone knows when you're not getting that block on the offense, on the defense, on TV. So is there anything you need to do mentally to make sure like, I got to get there, so let's go get there this way or that way. And he kind of... Like, dance around the, you didn't really want to answer that particular question. But to me, that's what it comes down to is like, are the guys in the right positions and are the right guys on the football field to fix the run game? What do you think that is going forward? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, cause that's the question. It's gotta be, right? it, does it have to be personnel? I guess is the thing is, is it personnel? That's, that's the whole question, right? Yeah. Is, is you can keep, doing all of these things with the guys that you have and trying new things and trying to tailor it to, to maximize the potential that they have. 
and maybe that will work, but maybe there's a possibility that the players that you have or some of the players that you have or some of the pieces that you have fitting it, right? Like, yeah, it, it all, it all plays off of one another because you can have a guy who has talent who it, it's just, it's the reality of the offensive line. Let, is if there's, let's, a, if, if there's a, if there's one weakness, it can be exploited yep. at times. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter how much making up for that, that you want to try to do. It, it can ding the next guy. Yeah. Can ding the guy next to him. And there's one thing that they lacked this year. I'm going to circle back to that thought in just one second, but something just cropped up there. You can, and the Arkansas offensive line is a great example of this, of their center gets after it. He In, in their zone blocking scheme, he fires off the ball and is launching himself into his block. And it creates some real problems for defensive tackles. Like that level of snap off the ball, that aggression, that ability when you get there to actually make an impact, literally and figuratively, can change the mathematics for guys around you that maybe they weren't able to do something. Penn State didn't have a single one of those guys on the offensive line. Every once in a while, you get that out of Rasheed Walker on a down block. But you really did not get anybody that was changing the math up front where, okay, take this defender. He is now gone because we have an offensive lineman that is going to kick him out of the club. They didn't have that either. So they, it's not like they had anything they could hang their hat on. One of the things that you can talk about is talented players in situations that aren't favorable. And somebody asked a great question that I was struggling to find a way to ask uh, Caden Wallace at the, end of the, at the end of the interview of where do you see your fit best? And he didn't immediately say tackle. He didn't immediately, he said, I've been playing tackle since I got to school and like, I'm fine with it was essentially yeah. what he said. Yeah. So you've got a situation where I've been saying this all year that, the, that he was recruited out of high school. Every recruiting service saw him as a guard. I see him as a guard. I think he sees himself as a guard, but Penn State has no tackles. So Olaf Ashunu, Landon Tangwall, we got into talking about him a little bit and where he fits on the offensive line. I think the best thing for this offense would be just the chance to put people in the right position because Landon Tangwall is ready to play. And you now have another guy and Salim Wormley comes back and then you have guys and pieces that maybe didn't fit or were playing poorly this year. Suddenly everything works better when they're in the right position. The best laid plans, buddy, are right. of mice and men. And so, uh, you know, look, like I think some of those things may have changed this season if Salim Wormley had been available. Right. Uh, right. Like, I mean, it, just, he, it changes. He was one of the more big physical prospects they had as far as being able to move people. What I just described, what I just described. And I, I just I think that's a really interesting part of that conversation that it comes down to the no excuse argument, right? There's no excuse. You're out there on the football field. Get it done, or else you're all failures. And I, it, there's there's nuance to these things. It's it's just it's always so hard from this side of things when you, you see nobody wants to win more than these guys. Like nobody nobody is more invested. Nobody they're they're trying. They're they're, they're doing their best. Uh, it's just that sometimes that that best isn't good enough against opponents who are trying just as hard and might be in better positions to succeed. So now, I mean, I think this year, this what's coming with the bowl game, certainly off it, any chance that you get for a fresh start is, should be embraced. I think is being embraced and you, you, you go from there, you, you move forward and see what you got. We touched on it a little bit. A couple other topics I want to get to before we get out of here on Friday. Um, we didn't really talk a lot about what James Franklin had to say because a lot of it tends to be what we've heard before. But was there anything that he said or did today that stood out to you as far as something interesting or a nuance that you didn't have before? Oh, boy. That's a great question. He uh, – look, and – we kind of dance around it, I think is the media a little bit uh, of asking the direct question, is Jaquan Brisker going to play? Is right. Ronald Abacuddy going to play? Is uh, John Dotson going to play? Right. Like you've got these, these 
critical integral pieces of your team who you re, you know they have not made announcements yet as to whether or not they're going to play and you've seen the rest of the landscape in college football all show these flashing red lights of no even more often now than before these guys aren't going to play <laughs> right? I mean, even a guy uh, like ellis brooks there's rumors that he's not going to play yeah and, well but <laughs> But look, like there are, there are, there are always individual circumstances that go along with that. The one thing that James brought up that I thought was interesting was this notion of how the changing rules for agents to be involved and then agents then being tied to these marketing companies yeah. and those all having an influence on decisions that are made at this point. I, I thought that was an interesting perspective. I, yeah. I had not. Um, I had not heard that I would say before that, that it's not just agents who are telling these guys not to play it's mar marketing companies and, you know, kind of their futures that, yeah. uh, that become part of it. So no, I look, it, it's, it is a rapidly, rapidly shifting, <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but I heard a press conference of this state of chaos yeah college football december it, like this month has been such an incredible demonstration of the absolute anarchy that college football has become well it's literally Manny, it's literally has brought it up yeah it's literally no. two rivers coming together it's recruiting and it's your your team they're converging at the same point and when if you've ever watched water come together at any point, like I'm not talking just the Three Rivers Stadium, but that's what made me think about it. But like, if you go like watch a nature documentary and you see two different bodies of water come together, that's what chaos looks like. Just the swirling crap that can happen in that situation. And that's what the last two weeks were for this coaching staff. Yeah. And and so now it's, it appears to have settled somewhat, at least. Yeah. Manny Diaz was talking about how the NFL has this structure. And this is how the year plays out and that college football is tied inherently to the semester system of higher ed academics. Mm -hmm. And, and so they don't, they don't align. They don't mesh nicely because you need things to be in place before really the second week of January. That's when, that's when you want things to be done, but <laughs> you can't accomplish all of that in terms of, hiring and firing personnel, figuring out when somebody else is going to go somewhere yeah. and then making a replacement hire and then also bringing those players in. So it's moved up, it's advanced and you know, there don't appear to be these great answers to it. And so a lot of what Manny Diaz was saying were the same things that James Franklin was saying, which is yeah. just, Hey, it's complicated. It's, it is a messy, messy time in college football and these bowls are being impacted by it. And yep. so that's, that's, you know, it's <laughs> there weren't any answers because there aren't any answers to be had right now. And, this, and the uh, teams, a lot of the stuff is still in play. The teams that survive this and have an out are the ones that are in the college football playoff because, yep. you know, they're going to be playing into January. And that there's there's an incentive for that roster to stay together because you're definitely not going to opt out or leave early and miss a possible national championship. Another, I think, un noticed advantage for those teams is they get to they get to opt out of this stuff and focus just on the recruiting side of a bunch of this yep. stuff even if some coordinators do come up for jobs every once in a while from national uh powers and and the powers that be uh last couple things i want to get to uh i talked to jair brown it sounds like to me and he kind of indirectly said a couple of things referencing next season so it sounds like and, and this could just change because he has a great bowl game and suddenly he's a prospect Sounds like that's a guy that's coming back for 2022. Uh, any other ideas, any other players you talked to, things that stood out? Yeah, I well, I talked to Keaton Ellis. I mean, it wasn't about, obviously, coming back next season, but he, uh, again, I mean, he, he didn't address it head, head on in terms of the beginning of this season, but he did talk pretty extensively about making the adjustment from corner to safety and how big that is, yep. right? Like... It's not there. Yeah, they're all in the secondary, but it's just it's very, like very different. 
very different. And so that was, that was a big topic of conversation. Um, and then beyond that, and I think that this is something that we can all read into the way that we want, but it wasn't about the guys who were on the press conferences today, as much as it was the notable absences and what those mean. And so we're, we're going to have conversations obviously until the actual game, James Franklin said that he doesn't make these announcements for the players themselves. They have to yeah. do it themselves. That's just not how he operates, but John Dotson was not on any of the calls uh, and nor was Jaquan Brisker. So yeah. their, their immediate future. Yeah. I, I think it's, I, I think it's a fairly, fairly safe place to be that, those guys either are not going to play or will be very limited in yeah. whatever roles well, they take on. Even a guy that didn't opt out, Saquon Barkley played in the Fiesta Bowl, but Miles Sanders had a huge presence in that game as well. So it can work both ways, whether you come back for the game or you don't. Um, so that'll, I think, do it for today. I think we covered most everything. I forgot to say this at the beginning, by the way. Happy holidays to you. Merry Christmas. Hope you're having a festive season yourself. I'm trying to survive, dude. It's <laughs> two kids under four. Yeah, I'm happy we're, to be awake. We're we're going to uh, we're going to my wife's uh, family's presents. My my in laws. We're going out out west for Christmas. So oh, nice. we, we did our Christmas last night because her present came in the mail and it was too big for me to hide. So we mm. just like, hey, Christmas is happening right now. So <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the holiday spirit. I even turned the lights on in the background. So uh, to you and your family, Nate, I am eternally grateful for the opportunities provided by Blue White Illustrated, which you and Ryan Snyder especially had a huge hand in in making oh, that happen. Stop. So I just want to say, and I'll probably say it again next week, you know, but it's just going to be a busy sort of season. I don't know if we're going to have another chance to. I want to say thank you to you and Ryan for everything you've done for me and my family uh, this year because this is the best job I've ever had. I worked 18 hours earlier this week for National Signing Day, and yesterday I was thinking to myself, I really like my job. How many times have you been able to do that and say that later? So thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Your talent speaks for itself. I have nothing to do with it. But <laughs> in any case, yeah, it's fun. This has been great. Let's keep doing it. All right. Let's get out of here. Let's uh, let's get you off because practice is coming up a little bit later today. So I want to make sure you get to that. And of course, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube. Uh, you can get our podcasts wherever you get your podcast. That is, uh, you know, I always say that, but like Apple Podcasts, it's everywhere. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know all of the places because I get mine all on Google. But if you get it on on Spotify, any of those places, get our podcasts, and of course, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com to subscribe to get the main source of information on Penn State football, Blue White Illustrated. Happy holidays. We will talk to you again on Monday. <laughs>